Listener Production. Hi, Ben Sion Siebert with you. Welcome to The Briefing. It's been one year since the Hamas-led October 7 attacks killed more than 1,100 Israeli people, devastating the nation and the Jewish diaspora. Amongst those hostages were my sort of aunt slash cousin, Margaret Moses, sort of in her 70s, spent most of her life living on that kibbutz, uh, and also her ex-husband, Gadi Moses. Margalit was released in that first wave of hostage releases after 49 days, and Gadi is still being held. Sasha Barbagat's conversation with a Jewish Australian 12 months on is coming up in the second half of this episode. Since October 7, the Israeli Defence Force has killed more than 41,000 people in Gaza, hundreds in the West Bank, and the death toll in Lebanon is at least 2,000 and climbing. Today, we're bringing you two personal stories from people whose lives have been profoundly affected by October 7 and the violence since. This morning, Sasha chats with Dan, who details his personal struggle and fears for his relatives still held hostage in Gaza. And in our afternoon episode, you'll hear from a twice-displaced Palestinian woman about 75 years of oppression and occupation and her reflections on this day. First, though, let's get into the headlines with Chris Spiru. It's Monday, October 7. Morning, Bentian. Morning, everyone. We start today in the Middle East, where Lebanese officials say 23 people have been killed and more than 100 injured in Israeli strikes on Beirut overnight. Several people were also killed by an Israeli strike on a mosque and a school in Gaza, and that's according to the Gazan Health Ministry. Meanwhile, a policewoman was killed and 10 others injured in what's been described as a terrorist attack in the southern Israeli city of Beersheba. Police shot the gunman dead. And the Israeli Defence Force says about 30 rockets fired by the Lebanese terrorist group Hezbollah fell mostly on evacuated areas in the north of Israel. Yeah, and back home, PM Anthony Albanese and opposition leader Peter Dutton will join vigils with members of Australia's Jewish community to mark the anniversary of the October 7 attack today. Thousands of people gathered for peaceful pro-Palestine demonstrations calling for a ceasefire in Melbourne and Sydney yesterday. Over now to the US, where billionaire Elon Musk has been slammed for joining Donald Trump at a rally at the site of Trump's attempted assassination in Pennsylvania in July. Elon Musk is the richest person in the world. He's got a tremendous amount of interest in Donald Trump being elected president because Donald Trump made it. I mean, it's clear he's going to double down on tax cuts to billionaires while sticking it to uh, American families. That was Democratic Senator Mark Kelly speaking to CNN there. Musk took to the stage at the former president's invitation, claiming a Trump win is essential to preserving the US Constitution and democracy, suggesting a win for Democrats would be the last free election. The other side wants to take away your freedom of speech. They want to take away your right to bear arms. They want to take away your right to vote effectively. And as for Trump, he appeared sentimental at the rally yesterday, calling for a moment of silence at exactly 6.11pm. So that was the same time gunfire erupted on July 13. Um, a, a bell rang out four times, one for each of the four victims, including Trump himself. And the former president went on to say that returning to Butler was an obligation, saying in an interview that we never finished what we were supposed to do. And a big topic of discussion around this rally, Bensian, was the protection that would be made available. And there was a lot of back and forth, I know, across this whole election campaign, talking about the role of the Secret Service and whether Kamala had blocked, you know, Trump protection and things like that. In a statement ahead of the rally, a Secret Service spokesperson said that there had been comprehensive changes and enhancements to their communication capabilities, resourcing and protective operations so as to avoid the operational failures identified back in July. This rally in Pennsylvania didn't give us the iconic moments that we got last time where we had Trump with a raised fist in the air saying, fight, fight, fight. But we did get Elon Musk jumping up and down on the stage, which is um, equally as iconic for some. And in the NRL, the Penrith Panthers have won their fourth straight premiership, beating Melbourne Storm 14-6. to The Penrith faithful rejoice. It is very hard to comprehend, but the Panthers have done it again. Four premierships in a row. 
They're the first team to claim four straight premierships in over 60 years, and that's a feat many thought was impossible during the salary cap era. A crowd of 80,156 people was on hand at a core stadium in Sydney, while the Sydney Roosters held off a furious Sharks comeback to claim a thrilling NRLW grand final victory. The Roosters led 24-0 at halftime before Cronulla came roaring back in the second half to pull within two with eight minutes to play. Yeah, and it was really exciting stuff over the weekend, Bentian, but I guess the one thing that caught my attention and that I cared about the most was obviously the pre-match entertainment. So the pre-match entertainment at the men's grand final, that was Kid Leroy. Um, he's the ARIA award-winning Grammy-nominated artist. He's 21 years old. Um, he grew up in Sydney, grew up in Redfern. He's a dedicated and diehard South Sydney Rabbitohs fan. Um, he had a 12-minute set and he performed, obviously, his hint with Justin Bieber, Stay. Um, Justin Bieber wasn't there, of course, but the song was performed. And look, he wrapped it up with the cover of In Excess's Never Tear Us Apart. So, you know, look, these are, these are two major grand finals we've had in Australia in the last two weeks. Both have delivered on their promise of great performances. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Chris, for joining us for the headlines. Changing pace now, and Sasha will bring us her interview with a Jewish Australian man whose cousin was taken hostage on October 7. Hey, Sasha Barbagat with you. The world is marking a grim milestone today, one year since the horrific October 7 attacks on Israel. More than 1,100 people were killed when Hamas militants poured over the border from Gaza, attacking neighbourhoods and the Nova Music Festival. A further 240 people were taken hostage. More than 115 of those are still unaccounted for. What has ensued since is devastating. More than 40,000 Palestinians killed in attacks launched by Israel following Hamas's attack, not to mention escalating tensions in the Middle East more broadly. Back home, Jewish Australians have reported feeling unsafe, targeted and attacked for their religion in the wake of the events of October 7 and beyond. Even before that, there had been growing reports of anti-Semitism in Australia. The last 12 months have been volatile, heavy and despairing for people here and around the world, whether they have a direct link to the conflict or not. But how is a Jewish Australian feeling today, a year on from the October 7 attacks? Joining me now to share his thoughts is Dan Monheit, whose cousin Margalit Moses was kidnapped from a kibbutz in Israel a year ago today. Dan, thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. We do appreciate it. First off, how are you feeling today? Morning, Sasha. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pretty heavy day, if I'm honest. It's been a very big 12 months and uh, it's an interesting point to just sort of reflect on everything that's happened between then and now. Mm. So tell me what happened to your family this day last year. Uh, so in my immediate family, or my, my family specifically, and we have a lot of family living in Israel. Part of that family live on Kibbutz Niroz, which is one of the kibbutzim right near what the area known as the Gaza Envelope, so a couple of k's from Gaza. It was one of the ones where I think 400 residents of the kibbutz, one in four, were murdered or taken hostage. Amongst those hostages were my sort of aunt slash cousin, Margaret Moses, who's sort of in her 70s, spent most of her life living on that kibbutz, uh, and also her ex-husband, Gadi Moses. Margalit was released in that first wave of hostage releases after 49 days and Gaddy is still being held. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that first off. I'm keen to understand what it felt like for you being here in Australia, hearing that a family member had been taken hostage on that day before the release. How did you deal with that feeling and you know, how did your family work through that until her release? The day it happened... Uh, it took a little bit of time for us to actually realize that's what had happened. First, there was just the sort of shock and disbelief of what was happening in Israel, just seeing the thousands of rockets getting fired in and then you know hearing these stories about these terrorists coming through the, the Nova Dance Festival and then making their way through Kibbutzim. And it was just, it, it was crazy trying to just get information about what was going on. And the first thing we did was sort of got on the phone and sort of messaged the family over there and it sounded like everybody was kind of, you know, shocked, but, but okay. And then it was, I, I actually, I can't remember if it was sort of 12 or 24 hours later, but we got a message saying, no, actually 
and Margalit and Gaddy have been taken and there was footage of her. So she's in her seventies and she was one of those people taken out in a golf cart. Uh, and there was footage of her being taken across into Gaza and, and that's how we found out. Mm. And what about in the moment that you learned that Margalit was alive and then had been, you know, freed from Gaza? What was that like for you and for your family? Uh, so obviously the so the seven weeks in between was was pretty harrowing. And then I think there were a couple of ladies who were released maybe the week prior and one of them had been held in a similar area to Margalit. So we'd sort of heard whispers or, or rumblings that she was alive and that she was doing okay. And then when she came out, I think you know the feeling for us was similar to friends and family of anybody who had had people released on that day, which is this very strange mix of, of gratitude and joy right up against the reality of knowing that there were still at the time, I think 150 or 160 still being held and still reeling from not just October 7, but what we saw in the immediate aftermath, both here in Melbourne and across the world. Mm. And you said Gadi is still, you know, unaccounted for at this stage. I mean, it's been nearly a year since he was taken. What is that like to not know how he is, how he is doing and whether he is okay? It's horrendous. Um, I've been to Israel twice in the last 12 months. I was there in January. I was there again in July this year. And uh, it's a very strange feeling of, you know, hope and loss with a small part of optimism because you're sort of hoping and there's just no closure. And I think you know, the, the big paranoia for, for Gadi and for everybody else, the hundred other hostages still being held is that the world will forget about them. And so we're just doing everything we can, advocating everywhere we can to try and have them released. You said you were able to travel to Israel twice uh, since October 7 and you have seen Margalit since her release. What did she tell you about her time as a Hamas hostage? The first thing to consider is, you know, a lady like Margalit who has spent most of her life living on a kibbutz, you know, she's a tough lady. So it was, it was strange because also for her there, there was a mix of you know, recognizing what had happened to her. I mean, she'd been take, ripped from her bed and taken and held in a, in a tunnel and it was terrible, but obviously not as terrible for a lady in her 70s as for somebody in their 20s. You know, I think your prospects as a hostage are different and also being released. And, you know, at the time there was still 150, 160 still being held. So she was sort of pragmatic about it. She was, you know, thankful to be out. She was, so she was held with a group of other women and she sort of took on the role as the boss, uh, and she spoke, she speaks Arabic quite well. So she was the one able to communicate with the guards and to tell them, you know, which ones needed food and which ones needed water and which ones needed medical care. And I think it's sort of quite true to her nature and her spirit. Her captors came to refer to her as commander sort of ironically, but she was, you know, she was the boss lady of the mother hen and just doing whatever she could to look after the, the hostages she was being held with. Has she expressed any thoughts or feelings towards Hamas and the people who took her captive since, or has she not been able to do that yet as she is kind of processing the trauma of what happened to her? She certainly didn't come out saying it was a great time. Uh, I mean, as somebody who's lived in Israel for her whole life, I mean, processing trauma and what you decide to deal with and not deal with, it's, it's a pretty different baseline to what we have here. So to be honest, I, I don't really know how she's dealing with it and how she's processing it, but there was a marked difference when I saw her in January where she'd only been out for you know a few weeks versus when I saw her with the rest of my family in July. And she just sort of seems to have really bounced back to her old self and obviously would love nothing more than to be able to go back to her home, uh, which she still can't do. But Israelis, including Margalit, just have an incredible way of just getting on with it, just living under perpetual threat of death and destruction and just, just getting on with it. Mm. We've spoken specifically about the impact on you and your family since October 7, but we can't ignore the fact that the world has really shifted and changed in the last 12 months. What do you think have been the biggest impacts of October 7 on the globe? I mean, maybe at a stretch, I can speak from my experience in the Jewish community uh, in Melbourne. As, as far as the globe, I, I guess there's probably people far better equipped. But for myself, my family, my community, this has been a very traumatic, confusing, disorienting 12 months. I think we realized that we were living in an era that we didn't realize we were living in. I think we had this post-Holocaust era of, of 80 years where to be Jewish was just 
at worst a non-issue, and at best it was amazing. We have this country called Israel, you know, this sort of beacon of democracy and tech innovation and coexistence and multiculturalism in Israel. Jews around the world could live openly as Jews and think nothing of it. And, you know, we had memories of the Holocaust, but for people, you know, in my forties, people my age, it was black and white and it's a thing from a different generation. And we really just thought we were living in a world where those sorts of things could never happen. And what we found out very quickly was actually there's this huge volcano of anti-Semitism waiting to explode. And as somebody who's lived in Melbourne my whole life, I've never, never experienced anti-Semitism ever in my life until October 7. And it is literally a daily occurrence now, whether that is picking stickers off poles around my home and office, whether that is reading content from our political leaders and their views and their unwillingness to condemn the acts of known terrorist organizations, whether it's seeing protests in our city streets, people calling for my death and destruction and the destruction of the only Jewish country in the world while our police and politicians look on and do and say nothing. I mean, it has been an intense 12 months and I think the whole community in Australia and around the world is wondering what is our place here and are we safe here and what would it feel like to not have Israel and not have a defence force to protect us. October 7 also piqued interest globally for the Middle East, a region that for a lot of people, they probably hadn't thought of too hardly before October 7 and before it became a globally recognised conflict. Conflict existed long before October 7, but in terms of having all eyes of the world on what was happening there, that's a relatively new thing. How has it felt for you and for your community to see people who maybe don't have an understanding of the history or don't understand what's gone on there or don't understand the history of Israel suddenly have opinions and thoughts and very vocally express them in the wake of the October 7 attack? It's confusing and it's confronting. There are over 100 armed conflicts currently happening in the world. Russia and Ukraine, there are terrible things happening to Uyghurs in China. There is huge war happening throughout Africa, the Congo, Syria, terrible things happening in North Korea. Not one of these incidents has caused any students to protest, to create encampments, to create weekly demonstrations through the city, to call for sanctions and boycotts. It is you know, the one defensive war that this tiny Jewish country neither asked for nor started that has somehow captivated the world's attention. And it's scary. I can't explain what it is. I don't know. I don't know why the world cares so much about this. And I don't know why people who couldn't point out Israel on a map suddenly feel entitled to have an opinion and why people with no skin in the game feel that while they would never question the existence of any other country, they have a right to question the existence of Israel. It's it's bizarre, it's confusing, and I don't know. <laughs> Maybe somebody else can explain it. Mm. Dan, I'm keen to understand, though, that people who care about the conflict in Gaza care about the loss of civilian life. And that was going to be my next question, was that while the tragedy of October 7 cannot be understated or underestimated, The subsequent loss of life in Gaza also can't be understated or underestimated. Mm -hmm. How do you, as a Jewish person, hold space for both of those? Are you able to? So the the short answer is absolutely I'm able to. And as as a community, as a people, as a tribe, as a religion, as a race, I mean, we, we celebrate life. We mourn death. We see every single loss of life as a tragedy. What seems to get lost or be willfully ignored is Israel is not at war with the Palestinian people. Israel is not at war with the Lebanese people. We empathize and we feel for every, you know, every innocent Palestinian, every innocent Lebanese person that has been affected by this. So it's all well and good to condemn Israel for what it's doing, but I, 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 nobody I'm yet to hear provide any other solution for how we are meant to keep our citizens safe when people living on our borders are sworn to our death and destruction and how we're meant to get hostages back and tell these terrorists that Jewish blood is not cheap. You can't just steal our babies from their beds and think nothing is going to happen. Do you wish for a ceasefire? Absolutely. But we have to be realistic enough to recognize that a ceasefire can only happen without Hamas, without Hezbollah, without the Houthis. The Hezbollah flag is a machine gun. 
Like we can't pretend that these are people that want to sit down and have a conversation. They are sworn to our death and destruction. So you know, the rest of the world says we don't negotiate with terrorists, but maybe Israel should try. We have to read the room. We have to get rid of Hamas. We have to get rid of Hezbollah. We have to get rid of the influence of Iran. And then absolutely, we get our hostages back. We have a ceasefire. I mean, look at Israel has a history of showing that it just wants to live in peace. Israel has to defend its citizens like any other country would. What will you be doing today on October 7 to commemorate, to mark the occasion? Or is it going to be a bit more of quiet reflection for you? It'll be both. Definitely quiet reflection. I think, you know, recognizing how much personally I've changed in the last 12 months, how much my family, how much my community, how much my people have changed, but also be coming together with hundreds, maybe thousands of other members of the community to raise awareness of the hostages, to celebrate life and to hope and pray for a, a rapid ending of this conflict. Mm. What would you like people listening today to keep in mind today? Israel is only doing for its people what any person living in any other Western democratic liberal country would expect its country to do. If we look at what's just happened on the northern border, I mean, Lebanon have been firing rockets for 11 and a half months, 8,000 rockets fired indiscriminately at civilian homes. And at some point, Israel has to say, this is enough. People can't live like this. No other country in the world would tolerate what Israel is expected to tolerate. Dan Monheit, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts and feelings with us on the briefing today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Sasha. Dan Monheit, whose cousin Margalit Moses was kidnapped during the October 7 attacks in 2023, speaking with me there. And that is all for this episode of The Briefing. Thank you for listening. In our next episode, we'll be continuing this conversation, speaking with a Palestinian refugee on their reflections on the day and how October 7th and the subsequent conflict has impacted them. Keep an eye out for that chat, which will be in your feed this afternoon from three. And if you do want to keep up with our other content, we put up plenty on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast. We're also on TikTok and YouTube and you can search Listener Newsroom to see our stuff there. Don't forget to like, follow and subscribe. I'm Sasha Barbagat. See you next time. Listener.